Ratio Analysis. Okay, in this B Business B presentation, we're going to look at the topic of ratio analysis. Now, this is one of the areas of business studies which many people find difficult to understand. So, what we're going to do in this presentation is break each area of the ratios down to smaller subsections and look at what they actually mean. Because most of you can calculate them given that you get the ratios in your exam on a piece of paper. However, how many of you actually know what they mean and then can draw any analysis or any evaluation based on these ratios? So let's take a look at what these ratios actually mean. Ratio analysis. We can use a series of financial ratios to help assess the overall performance of an organization. Now one lot of ratios we're going to use and start looking at is what's called profitability ratios. The first lot of ratios we're going to look at are profitability ratios. Now these are ratios which quite clearly assess the profitability of the organization. They typically look at the gross profit margin and the net profit margin. Now you need to learn these formulas for your exam. These will not be given to you in your exam paper. Now typically if you see the command word profitability in the question you want to be using either of these two ratios. You've got your gross profit margin, so that's your gross profit divided by your turnover times 100 and you've got your net profit margin which is your operating profit divided by your turnover times 100. Remember that your gross profit is basically showing you how much you make on each item you sell and your net profit margin is showing your overall profit, sometimes called your operating profit. Another type of ratio that you may need to use are your shareholder ratios. Now these are ratios that are used by shareholders to assess whether they should make an investment in an organization. Typically you're looking for the command word of shareholders or investors when you're deciding whether to use these ratios. And off your formula sheet you should be picking ratios such as dividend per share and dividend yield. Now let's have a look at these in more detail. Let's have a look at the dividend per share. This shows how much each share is worth as a dividend in pence to each shareholder. The higher the figure, the better the organization has performed according to the views of the shareholders. Remember, shareholders want bigger dividends because this is a return for the money they've invested in the business. It's a share of the profits. This is typically an indication of the profitability of the business. However, you have to remember that a profitable business may actually pay the shareholders a reduced dividend. Let's say they decide to retain some of the profits to invest in the future growth of the business. Then you have to balance this against the views of the shareholders. Some shareholders in the short term will not be happy about this. They expect to have large returns in the form of a dividend. However, long term investors may be happy to see the business using some of this shareholder money to keep it back, don't pay it out, and then instead invest in the growth of the business and they'll get bigger dividends in the future. So again, this is short-term, long-term playoff that you've got to use here. Another shareholder ratio is the one which is called dividend yield. This shows how much an organization pays out in dividends each year compared to its share price. The higher the percentage, the better the organization is performing. Investors typically use this as a decision on how much return they will get from their investment when they think about buying shares in an organization. So naturally you want a higher dividend yield. Bear in mind that if you've got a good dividend yield, shareholders are more likely to buy in your business. If shareholders are buying into your organization, then they're giving you free money in that essence. This is capital that you can use to invest and grow your organization. The alternative option to get this capital normally is to borrow the money. And if you were to go and borrow the money, then it normally comes at an expensive price tag where you have to pay interest back. So it's in your interest to try and get a higher dividend yield. Another form of ratios you may use are what's called liquidity ratios. Now liquidity ratios help to assess the cash flow or the liquidity position of the organization. Typically you're going to see the word liquidity in the command word in the exam questions. Ratios you may use to assess liquidity tend to be the current ratio and the acid test ratio. Let's start by looking at the current ratio. The current ratio compares the current assets to the current liabilities. Remember, current assets is money we owed in within one year, and current liabilities are all the things we owe within one year. This gives us a good indication of the current liquidity position of the organization. In this ratio, we tend to have an ideal figure that you should really know for your exam. This shows good analysis. Typically, you want the figure to be between 1.5 
to 1 or 2 to 1. Now, what that means is, in other words, it's about 1 being £1 pound of liability. So look on to the right hand side there, £1 pound of liabilities. You're looking for a figure of either £1.50 pound in current assets to every £1 pound of current liabilities you've got, or two pound in current assets to every one pound in current liabilities so you're actually starting to look at the figure here where if you were to wind this business down in the case here let's go for the most optimum figure there once you paid off your current liabilities you've got one pound left for every one pound of debt you've got so you've got an extra pound covering you so it's a good strong current liquidity position now, typically, you want to compare this figure to previous years and industry standards. That's how you'd use it. Now, some people in the world of business argue that the current ratio is not the best ratio. They like the acid test ratio. And that's because it's like the current ratio, the acid test ratio is, apart from it takes away stock as being a current asset. Now, the reason it takes away stock or inventory as a current asset is because some people argue that if you want to sell stock quickly, you're going to have to discount it. And that then devalues your assets, so it doesn't give a true figure. So the acid test ratio is a measure of your current assets minus your inventory compared to your current liabilities. And again, it's the same sort of ratio that you've got. This is typically seen as the best form of an indication of a company's liquidity. It can also be a sign of whether an organisation is holding too much stock or not if you've got a great disparity between the current ratio and the acid test ratio. An ideal figure for this one tends to be 0.75, so 75p in current assets to every £1 of current liabilities you've got, all the way up to £1 of current assets to £1 of current liabilities. Now, bear in mind, those figures are calculated without including stock. So that means that if you add your stock in, everything else is a bonus. So that is why it's seen as being an optimum figure. So you, when you sell your stock, hopefully in the first case, you obviously get more than 25p, you'd hope, and everything else there is profit for every pound that you're going to cover. When the second example, one-to-one, -one, everything else you sell extra is a bonus there. But remember, stock can perish, it can go off, and if you want to sell it quickly, you're going to have to discount it. So there are your two ratios that are used there. Another sort of ratio you may use is what's called a financial efficiency ratio. And these quite clearly measure how efficient an organisation is at managing their finances. Typical command word here is the word efficient or effective is the organisation. There are four ratios you should use for this. You should use your inventory or your stock turnover. You should use your payables or creditors days. You should use your receivables days. Or you should use your asset turnover ratio. So let's look at these individually. Okay, your asset turnover. Your asset turnover is probably the more confusing one of all these ratios. This shows you how hard an organisation is working to turn the assets they own into money. Typically, the higher the figure, the harder the organisation is working to turn these assets into money. This figure is typically compared to previous years. There is actually no industry standard and no ideal. You tend to look back at the figure and think, is it working them harder or not? And you're looking, hopefully, to use your assets more efficiently and work them harder. The problem with this figure is it can be skewed. Because if you start selling off your fixed assets, then you're going to increase your asset turnover. However, remember, this is a poor profit quality because it's not sustainable in the long term. So in the short term, you could actually increase your asset turnover but in the long term, your organisation will suffer. Typically, though, organisations that are looking to be sold may try and do the short-term approach of selling off some fixed assets to make them look more appealing to investors and people trying to assess the performance of their business. This is why some people would rather use the inventory turnover as an indication of efficiency rather than the asset turnover. So the inventory or stock turnover it does exactly the same as asset turnover, apart from it looks at stock only. So it measures how many times an organisation sells or replaces their stock over a given period. So in a shop, it's looking at how many times do you clear that item off the shelves and then you have to replace it again. Clearly, the higher the figure, the better the organisation is doing. And that should, in theory, mean they're making increased revenue and increased profits. Think of the shop example, as I said there. If they're selling more of the item and clearing the stock more times, they're going to actually make more money in the long term. 
A low figure tends to be bad because it shows that you may have stock sitting on a shelf and it could depreciate. Now remember depreciation is when an item loses value. And of course this could be a sign that you haven't got enough sales or your marketing is poor. However, again, you've got to also compare what sort of market you're in. Because some industries will have higher or lower inventory turnovers. So the retail industry would have a high inventory turnover you'd expect. Maybe a customised product that's made to order would have a low inventory turnover in theory. So again, it's fairly straightforward to calculate. Just make sure you get into your head that this is probably one of the more efficient ones to use because it takes into account inventory turnover. Okay, two of my favourite ones now. The ones I like to use. You've got this one called debtor days or receivable days as a new term. This shows how long an organisation is giving their customers to pay when they've been given credit. So remember credit is when you give them time to pay. They get 30 days, 60 days, 90 days credit. The number of debtor days tends to vary according to the industry. So there is no industry standard really in theory. Typically if you want to look at it, the 30 day rule is fairly common however in some industries it's a lot higher than that however this in this figure should always be shorter than the organization's creditor days now remember they're the people who you have to pay money out to so you want to be getting this money in before you pay other people now if you want to get remember this you think about this word of debtor means debt to you or debt owed to you so this shows you the number of days it takes you to collect your money off people who owe you money you want this figure to be as close to the figure you're giving them. So if you give them 30 days, you want this figure to resemble 30 days. Let's say this figure actually resembles 60 days and you're giving them 30. This shows you're very poor at collecting your money. You're giving your customers 30 days longer than they're actually entitled to. And this could cause you a cash flow problem in the future. So that's poor financial efficiency. Now, of course, you've got the opposite side of this. You've got your payables or your creditors days. Now, these are people who you have to pay and this is how long it takes your organization to pay your suppliers when they have given you credit the number of days again that you get varies according to the industry and how you negotiate them typically though you want these to be greater than your debtor days like I said before so if you are giving your customers 30 days to pay you you ideally want to have 60 days in your suppliers to pay them now in an ideal world what you really want to do here is you want this figure down here to resemble that you're taking a little bit longer. Remember that it's about making sure your cash flow is positive. If that money is in your bank account, you are getting interest on that. You are sl making slight amounts of money on holding that money for a little bit longer. So, for example, if you've got 90 days credit off your suppliers, so you need to pay them in 90 days, if this figure when you calculated here was showing that you were actually paying them in 110 days, that could be really good because it shows you're holding on for a little bit longer as long as you're not annoying your suppliers but they're not quite happy with that idea they're getting paid you're holding on to that for just a slight little bit longer and you're going to make 20 days in that case more interest payments remember creditor means people who are giving you credit so people who you actually owe money to one of the more obvious ratios is what's called a gearing ratio now in the world of business, gearing is basically the fancy term for debt. So this measures how much your organisation is actually funded by borrowed money. And the command word tends to be geared. The ratio you're going to use is called the gearing ratio, as you see below. Now this ratio shows how much of an organisation is made up of borrowed money. Typically you're looking for a figure between 25 and 50% is seen as an ideal figure. Seems strange that some debt is seen as positive. This is because some people will view debt as being a sign of investment in an organisation. It's a sign that the organisation is continually trying to grow itself. However, once more than 50% of the money in the organisation is borrowed money, that's when it's deemed to be a problem. Others would argue that that 25 figure is probably about the realistic figure because 50 can cause a problem if interest rates were to rise. So if you're highly geared, you're dependent on interest rates being low. So you've got your external factors to consider. However, if you're not geared at all, then it could be a sign that your business is stagnant, standing still. And then, of course, if you stand still, your competitors may be growing. And at the same time, you're actually getting smaller and starting to retrench and shrink in the market size. And last but not least, you've got this ratio here that I've left at the end, which is called the Return on Capital Employed, or the ROCE. This ratio is a strange one. You can use it anywhere you want. 
Some people argue it's a profitability ratio. Some argue it's a shareholder ratio. We'll have a look at why there's different arguments in a minute for this. This ratio shows the return you get on the money you've invested in the business. Now, as you probably can think straight away, owners like to use it, or shareholders do, and it shows about profitability because you get better returns when you make more profit. This ratio, like I say, can be used anywhere you want. It depends on who wants to draw conclusions from it. So in the exam, typically, you can throw it in where you like, as long as you draw valid conclusions that answer the question set. Everybody typically agrees the higher the percentage, the better the organization is performing. It makes it a more attractive investment. Now, what you need to compare with this to is normally the Bank of England interest rate. You're looking for what the Bank of England is setting its base rate and what you can get as the best savings rate in the bank. So, for example, if you could put your money into the bank now and get 3% on a savings account, but you can get an ROC and a business of 20%, well, you're going to choose a business straight away. The business is more risky, but the fact that you're getting 20% compared to 3 makes it worth taking that risk. However, if the interest rate was actually 3 but the return on the investment was only 5, then you may think about putting your money in the bank. The bank is much safer, and remember, the ROC is based on the business actually achieving those figures. It's what they got in the past. Will they achieve it in the future? Well, again, you've got to consider market factors such as like competition or what are the external pressures on the organization. And these are all factors you've got to consider when thinking about whether the ROC will be maintained. Remember, most of these ratios are calculated on past data. So will the business achieve these in the future? That's what you're looking for. And that's what you've got to take into account when you're making some decisions. Okay, that's it. Hopefully now you've got a better understanding of each of the financial ratios. And you're able to provide basically the correct ratios that are going to help you to tackle the question that's set in the exam. And you can make some form of decision making as a result of this. What I've tried to do is not get you to calculate with the ratios because it's fairly straightforward. You'll have practiced that a number of times and you're probably well aware of that. If you need more practice on this, have a look on my website. I've got some information on there for you. No problems with that. Finally, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at BBusinessB and check out my YouTube channel. Click that subscribe button. Uh, remember, you can tweet me any areas of business in the future you want me to cover. I've got no problems with that. And check out my website, BBusinessB.co.uk.